my name is Yonana Gal. Uh, I'm from Israel and I'm a co-president of Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, I wonder if you can share some more of your thoughts and ideas uh, and takes about what's going on right now in Israel, which is also an implication of the occupation. Uh, right now in the news there is the case of, in Jaffa that um, the government annexed more Palestinian neighborhood in order to build, um, right now it's a synagogue for the Jewish community um, and other Jewish neighbor, neighborhoods. Um, so I wonder if you maybe share with um, you American citizens what, what can we take of the United States about the domestic issues with the Palestinians in Israel. Thank you. Yeah, actually that's quite important than another topic, but uh, since it wasn't specifically the occupation, I'll talk about it. But it's what's happening in Israel now is uh, very dangerous, I think. There's a very sharp drift to the ultra-nationalist right, extremist right. And in fact, to go back to South Africa, that's pretty much what happened there. Uh, when you get through into the 1970s and into the 1980s, as you know, the international opposition became stronger and increased and became implemented in sanctions and boycotts and so on. South Africans reacted, I mean they varied of course, there were some who struggled against apartheid, but the large majority and the government they reacted by just becoming more repressive, violent, circling the wagons, saying okay, the world doesn't understand us, the world's against us, we're perfect, nobody understands us. So what has become harsher and more brutal? And uh, uh, and they, they just, you know, almost in your face, like there was a contact group under Carter that was trying to arrange something about Namibia. South African territory, South Africa held the territory of the World Court, the United Nations, and argued they, it's totally illegal, they have to give it up. But South Africa wanted it, they had a big port, there were whites living there. Uh, right at the point where the, the contact group was Europe and basically the United States with a couple of European allies. Uh, just as they were meeting to try to achieve a settlement, uh, South Africa picked that moment to carry out a murderous attack on an Angolan refugee camp in Kasinga, uh, killing 600 people. It's the kind of thing that Israel's doing. Uh, just saying, well, okay, you don't like us, we'll show you, we'll be tough and brutal. And internally, the, the rules became more brutal too. And Israel's reacting very much the same way. I mean, they're, first of all, they're moving towards an extreme form of irrationality. I mean, it's almost shocking. Like the, uh, the treatment of the Turkish ambassador, you know, their one ally, they're just purposely insulting and humiliating him. That just doesn't happen in diplomatic circles. Uh, Lieberman, the foreign minister, just did the same thing to the uh, uh, prime ministers of France and uh, Spain told them, you know, get lost in a very ugly terms. Then Netanyahu is just doing the same right now to Obama. Uh, it, I mean, it happens in minor ways too. Like, you know, I mean, I was a minor example myself. Uh, in May, I was invited to talk at uh, Birzeit, the Palestinian University. Uh, my friends and I decided to go in through Amman because if you get turned back at the Nobody who's Jewish ever gets turned back, but we thought there's a possibility. So, uh, because of what's happening in Israel, if you get turned back from at the Allenby Bridge, you just have to go back to Oman. You get turned back at Ben Gurion Airport, you got to come back to the United States. We were going on to uh, Beirut, so we went in, and the Ministry of Interior wouldn't allow me in. Uh, they, when it be, when there was an international protest, it, it's a minor incident, but it, it's again shooting themselves in the foot. If they'd allowed me to go to Birzeit to give a talk, as I've done many times before, nobody would have even known. Okay? But this way, you know, international press, protests, and so on, but they then tried to lie their way out of it and say that it was a border f official that didn't know what he was doing, but that was totally untrue. It was the Ministry of Interior the whole way. And what they were upset about was interesting. Uh, you could see from the questions that a couple of hours, my daughter and I were kept there for interrogation. It was basically one question. How come you're going to lecture in a Palestinian university and you're not going to Israel? If I'd said, okay, I'll go to Israel and talk at you know, Tel Aviv University, that would have been fine. 
But the idea that a Palestinian university could invite somebody to speak, actually on American foreign policy, that had nothing to do with Israel-Palestine, the idea that they could do that was intolerable. And that's, again, just a minor example of irrationality. The uh, Mavi Marmara, you know, the attack on a ship, Turkish ship in international waters, murdering people, that's much more serious. And, uh, but they're acting kind of the way South Africa did, and internally as well, as in the example you mentioned, but also in a series of laws that are coming through. Uh, if, if you want to have a look at them, there's a small article by uh, Neve Gordon, an Israeli professor at Ben-Gurion, in the London Review of Books, and I think maybe the last issue, in which he just runs through some of the laws that are being considered and already passed the cabinet and will be implemented uh, in Israel. And they're, they're really pretty ugly. Uh, one of them, which I think is just about to be implemented, uh, requires that uh, non-Jewish immigrants have to declare loyalty to Israel as a Jewish state. Okay, that's like, as Steve Gordon points out, it's like uh, somebody, an immigrant to England, being uh, compelled to declare loyalty to the Anglican Church. You know, the civilized countries don't do that. Uh, they say non-Jewish immigrants for a reason. A lot of the Jewish immigrants won't do it. Orthodox Jews, for example, will not agree to that. So you've got to make it a racist uh, distinction. Uh, there's another, uh, there's another uh, law coming along uh, which would actually criminalize statements to the effect that Israel's not a Jewish state. That's pretty extreme, you know. It's like in England, you know, law saying you have to, it's, it's a criminal act not to say it's an Anglican state. Uh, Anglican church is the official church, you know. Uh, you know, and, and a series like that, one of them, which is really important and isn't discussed much, has to do with the land laws. The most racist laws in Israel since 48 have been the land laws. There's a complex, I wrote about it years ago, you can look it up, but the, what it comes down to is that over 90% of the land was placed under the authority of an organization, Karen Kayyem at the Jewish National Fund, uh, which has a charter with the state of Israel in which it's stated that they can act only for the benefit of people of Jewish race, religion, or origin. Okay, that's the wording. Uh, you pay for that, all of you, because it's tax-free. It has tax-free status in the United States. So when you pay your taxes, you're paying for an organization that controls over 90% of the land in Israel through various arrangements and must act for people of the Jew uh, benefit of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. And not many countries could get away with this, maybe none. Uh, well, that was finally overcome. Uh, in the year, there are civil rights groups in Israel. In the year 2000, they brought a case to the high court. A case involved a, an Arab couple, professional middle-class couple, who wanted to buy a home in a Jewish town. And that went you know, through the courts, finally reached the high court, the Supreme Court, and they ruled against it, which is quite important. Now, that formally overturned the land laws, but then followed something which we we're all very familiar with in the United States, a series of measures to try to get around it. Uh, so in fact, one of them is now a, the law hasn't really been implemented, but it's on the books. Uh, now there's a proposal in the Knesset to uh, uh, allow a community to uh, refuse uh, admission to any family that isn't congenial to the community, you know, or that doesn't has a culture different from that of the community. In other words, Arabs, you know, Palestinian citizens, uh, not unfamiliar in the United States. Actually, I've gone through it myself, but. Uh, ugly, you know, and, and there are other proposals like that coming along. Israel's just becoming a very ugly country uh, in many ways, which was not true before. And I think the South African analogy is pretty appropriate. That's what happened there. Given what's been happening with the dedications of types, as an example, types of different squares in Ramallah um, after barters and other things like that going on, 
What is your opinion of the Islamization of the conflict and whether it adds or detracts to the Palestinian cause and legitimacy? So how does it help or detract from the Palestinian cause and its legitimacy? Well, personally, I think that that's harmful everywhere. It's harmful all over the world. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, a rise of uh, sort of religious fundamentalism in many parts of the world, including the United States, and I think it's extremely harmful. Uh, you can understand it, you know, you can think of reasons for it, uh, but whether it's Islam or uh, Christianity as it is here, or uh, Hinduism as it is in uh, India, it's pretty ugly uh, and has, uh, is, I think it's very harmful to the Palestinian cause. And so that's not something foreign to us. Uh, we should bear in mind that uh, part of the reason for you know, this kind of outlandish U.S. support for Israeli crimes is Christian Zionism. Christian Zionism long precedes Jewish Zionism. It goes well back into the 19th century. And in a country like the United States, the United States is kind of off the spectrum in religious extremism in the Western world. I mean, about a third of the population in the United States believes in the literal word-by-word -word truth of the Bible. And the Bible says, you know, God promised the land to the Jews. So therefore, anything they do is right, and we got to support it. Uh, that was a sort of a passive phenomenon in the United States until the last 20 or 30 years when party managers recognized that they could mobilize this force as a, a force against uh, you know, everything that they don't like, you know, uh, the civil rights, uh, human rights, uh, 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 and in this case, uh, uh, in favor of support for Israel. In fact, Israel has special, a special kind of mission, even special newspapers, to appeal to the a fundamentalist evangelical community, which is substantial. Uh, I should add that they are the most anti-Semitic people in the world, in history, in fact. If you literally take a look at the end times literature, you know, uh, which has been developing since in parallel with the, uh, uh, with the establishment of Israel, really took off in 48. That was taken to be, okay, the sign God is telling us, you know, Jews are going back to Palestine. 1967 gave it another big shot in the arm. Uh, this appeals to a large part of the population, huge in fact. Their line is that uh, they want to uh, see a conflict, a battle between the Jews and the Arabs or the Iranians or the Russians or anybody, anybody which will end up in Armageddon, which they all slaughter each other and uh, the souls who are saved rise to heaven and Jesus comes and you have a thousand years of peace and so on and so forth. Actually, for some reason, I don't know why, 144,000 Jews get saved. Don't ask me why. But the rest, <laughs> the rest get exterminated and go to eternal damnation. I mean, even Hitler didn't go that far. But that's the group that's the strongest support uh, for Israel in the United States and that is being mobilized by Israel and. Uh, and by political leaders and so on. So uh, that's one manifestation of this. And when it happens in, uh, let's say, with Hamas and uh, Gaza, or to an extent in the West Bank, it's equally, uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't have that power, enough, but it's the same dangerous kind of phenomenon. It's happening in many places, and it's uh, quite dangerous. I think you're right to bring it up.